We are the best kept secret in the universe. We work for a highly funded yet unofficial government agency. Our mission is to monitor extraterrestrial activity on Earth. We are your best, last, and only line of defense. We work in secret, we exist in shadow, and we dress in black. Now playing listeners, this is Arnie, Stuart in LA, and this is Jacob. And in case you've been neuralized or just living in SETI Alpha 3 for a while, we want to make sure you knew that our spring donation drive is kicking off today, and our silver level donation is two different series. Coming out today is the first show of that first series, Men in Black. The classic 90s Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones, buddy alien cop comedy. Here's a clip from that show, and then I'll be back to tell you about all the other shows we're doing this spring. And yes, Jacob, you're right. There are Border Patrol here. I'm, are they busting them, or could they be paid off? They seem to know Nick, and they seem to know his reputation of yeah, taking illegals for a hundred ahead into the country. Maybe he's successful, maybe he's not, but he's always gets paid for it. My sense is that they know his reputation, maybe even let him slide, but we'll never know because they're instantly interrupted by the arrival of our actual leading man, the top build actor here, Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones, he's the only person we didn't discuss pre-plot summary, and he's kind of an interesting one in this project, because I don't know a whole lot about Tommy Lee Jones behind the scenes, so I tend to get him confused with the character types he plays in The Fugitive and in this movie. I never would have guessed what I learned when he did a commentary with Sonnenfeld for this movie that he'd read the comic, that's what attracted him to the project, and he was fiercely protective of that comic's tone in this. I'm sure he gets offered a lot of parts just like this in this decade. You know, keep in mind, he won the Oscar for The Fugitive about five years before, playing more or less, yeah, a hard-ass government official who is relentless and no sense of humor, or rather, the sense of humor comes from the fact that he is unstoppable. And he pursues Harrison Ford. I think his most famous scene in that movie is, I don't care what your motive is. My job is to catch you. No nonsense guy. And my understanding from a lot of productions that talk about Tommy Lee Jones is that he can be a little difficult, that he can be just as sour as some of the characters he plays. So it's kind of surprising here to see him want to, yeah, do a comic book movie and a comedy. Especially after Batman Forever. Yeah, I I agree. They should take his Oscar away. Yeah, that's the opposite side of this is the... uh... Could you say the other face? With two faces? Yeah, Natural Born Killers, Batman Forever. You're right, though, Stuart. When U.S. Marshals was shooting, it was shooting not too far from my house. I have a whole bunch of friends who went down there and saw them shooting. And Tommy Lee Jones was very just dismissive, rude. Whereas Robert Downey Jr. was out there shaking hands, signing autographs, and being friendly to everybody who walked by. So that was the only personal story I know about Tommy Lee Jones. So yeah, I was surprised that he was one of the driving forces behind this film once he got on board. And he actually refused to do the project because he told Spielberg that the script he read was way too different from the comic and he wanted to do the comic. And Spielberg just swore to him the script will be better when we make it. And so he signed on. Yeah, this feels like a movie where people signed on without the script being done or that it constantly changed based on, oh, now we got this person or that person. I I will say this. I think he is a perfect flavor for this movie and I genuinely like him as an actor. I think he usually brings kind of the same flavor, but it's one that when used properly can be very enjoyable. He's made terrible performances and we've talked about those performances but when he's good he's good and i think he's good here yeah i I think he plays a good uncle phil to go back to will smith's tv show like that is what i remember working so well on the fresh prince is you have the goofball and then you have the very serious 
Uncle Phil. And, and that's that's what we're going to have. That's the same dynamic. It's going to be here. And yeah, Tommy Lee Jones, just the look on his face. Like, I can't imagine that guy ever smiling. I don't know if we see him smile in this film, but he, he's just got that presence that like, yeah, he is your straight man. He's going to be a great straight man. Oh, yeah. He smiles. There's that scene when later on in the film, he neuralizes Jay. And then he's like telling a bad joke in a diner and telling him he can't have, hold his tequila. He's laughing and smiling. It's so out of character that it stuck with me, you know, because you don't see him do that. When you see him laugh, it's very whiplash inducing. And I agree. He is absolutely perfect in this part. His dry delivery and his timing. I understand he didn't think he was being funny. He actually was pissed during half the shooting, thinking the director wasn't going to let him be funny. And it was a Will Smith show. And it wasn't until he saw the editing and everything, but the timing, the laconic delivery, he's every bit as funny as Will Smith in this, even in the scenes without Will. I mean, the director heaps praise on Will, saying, all you have to do to be funny is to stand next to Will Smith. He's funny enough for everybody. But no, I, Tommy Lee brings it himself and deserves the billing he gets, both for his Oscar, his career, and his presence in this movie. But at the beginning here, he's partnered with somebody else, D, who, this is his one and only scene, a man even older and craggier than Tommy Lee Jones, who, this is his last job, he's retiring? Yeah, you, you see him, he gets pushed over by that alien, he can't shoot it, that alien almost attacks those Border Patrol guys, so I, I guess that's that means it's, it's time to retire. I mean, this whole setup tells you so much about this world. We see the alien. We see their weapons, and now we're going to see a neuralizer as they de-retires, and they're going to zap his memory. And they zap the INS agents, and a wonderful detail, more men in black come in with flamethrowers. Yes. But if you notice, they're wearing flame-retardant black suits. Their suits are like glossy rubber suits, but it's still like the black suit that they all wear. This sets the wrong impression, though. I gotta say... When I heard about this concept, I think everyone, when you hear about this concept, usually the way it's pitched is, oh, it's like Ghostbusters. And I just assumed that. And seeing this opening scene, it gives you the impression that the men in black are here to protect us from space aliens, that it's their job to shoot them, blow them up, get rid of them. I didn't really understand as the movie progressed why they did kill him. In the beginning, I thought that that was what they were always going to do. But honestly, they hadn't been spotted. If Mikey had been able to keep his costume on without other humans seeing, actually, I don't even understand why they shoot Mikey. Well, because he goes to attack that Border Patrol agent. He's got all his little frills out and screaming. And why does he do that? He was agitated because he knows and all the aliens know that the bug is coming to destroy the Earth. And so all the aliens are breaking their visas or whatever it is that says they will stay in Manhattan and trying to escape on every ship, you know? As Zed will say later in the film, it's like the party's over and the last person gets stuck with the bill. And so Mikey is panicked. He wants off the planet. So when the INS agent sees him, I'm guessing that's why he attacks the INS agent is he's agitated or... This isn't a plot-driven movie. I think this may be now playing's first comedy review, and so I think we got to kind of gloss over certain plot elements that are just there to create a good scene like an INS agent covered in alien blood. Yeah, no, I agree. This is not a movie where you want to poke too often at the plot. There's a lot of things that happen because it's funny or because it helps, you know, shuffle things along. But like I said, because it sets the mood that men in black are guys that are here to shoot space aliens, I it made this sort of an awkward introduction. I think that this is, I'll go ahead and say it. I like the idea that they're making the parallel between illegal aliens aliens crossing the border and you know space aliens coming into america but i feel like it's actually not the best introduction particularly since the rest of this movie is not taking place in texas it's taking place in new york city yeah that was a script change before sonnenfeld was brought on this was actually a story that took place across the entire country and traveled different states sonnenfeld decided new york was better but I never got that they were there to shoot aliens. I mean, if you look at how they treat Mikey when he unmasks, they're giving him a dressing down and they're telling him to go back to where he should be. But 
it's not like as soon as they see an alien, they break out a gun and shoot him, at least not to kill. I mean, they do shoot Tony Shalhoub a lot, but... But Ghostbusters, they're there to bust ghosts. So if this is Ghostbusters with aliens, I'm just coming into the movie thinking that. And the fact that the alien ends up, yeah, splattered for reasons when I didn't understand why he was even shot. Like I said, I feel like they could have scripted a better introduction for the characters, but Tommy Lee Jones is good, and I guess he's the only one that will matter. Everyone else here will not be seen for the rest of the movie. Yeah, because we're going to cut very quickly to the person who steals the show, if they're not technically the star, Will Smith, in a role that has to be very comfortable for him, post-Independence Day, post-Bad Boys... He's a cop. Man, I gotta say, that there's a few pop culture references that date this movie. Otherwise, I think it holds up, but his outfits here date this movie. Like, I have not seen bright yellow pants like this since 1997. Yeah, he is still Fresh Prince. It should just be said. I think that show was still wrapping up. I think it was still on the air, or maybe he had just gone off the air around this time. Still on the air. And yeah, I just feel like this This is literally the wardrobe. Like, he might have literally run <laughs> off of the set to the Guggenheim Museum because it's 90s hip-hop fashions. It's amazing. You are not wrong, sir, because the reason there's so much more Tommy Lee Jones than Will Smith is Will Smith was busy filming Fresh Prince and he came right from finishing Fresh Prince for the season <laughs> to shooting this and they even make a joke about it because when Jay sees his third grade teacher hey it's from Philadelphia born and raised on the playground is where I spent most of my days oh is that a thing? That's the opening theme song for the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I remember that credits, but I not word for word, apparently. And so, uh, again, I want to just, in case you didn't pick it up, I don't know shit about Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> He got you into hip hop, but that's it. You stopped there. Yeah, I left him quickly. Like, it was that one song and Summertime. And you know what? I still got a soft spot for Summertime, but that's it. And yeah, nothing else that he's done has been in my purview. But I will say, just seeing him here on the screen, I was shocked by how young he looked. I mean, he seems really fresh, Prince. I mean, he <laughs> seems like a kid. He seems like... Maybe this would have been his first or second acting gig. And admittedly, he had already been in show business for a decade. But I guess I just think of him now as the middle-aged dad. And it was just kind of surprising to see back when he was, he could play a rookie cop. So if you'd like to hear that entire show, as well as reviews of all the Men in Black films, plus Independence Day and Independence Day Resurgence... That is available in our Spring Donation Drive. If you're new to the show, Now Playing is an independent podcast done because we just have a fathomless love of movies and we enjoy doing it. But, but what's free for you to listen to every single Tuesday without fail isn't free for us to make. And so we do donation drives twice a year so that the listeners can support the show and allow it to keep going. And so for a donation of $10 or more, you get those five bonus podcasts, the three Men in Black, one per week on Friday starting today, and then later this summer, Independence Day 1 and 2, tying in with that sequel's theatrical release. And if you go $25 or more, then you get six additional podcasts on top of those. We're doing a kind of loose anthology retrospective of the sci-fi films of summer 1986. And we don't mean Aliens, Howard the Duck, Poltergeist 2, <laughs> or any of the other movies we've already covered in various franchises. It was a big summer. That's why we picked it. It was 30 years ago. And these are all the properties that, well, they did have franchises, a few of them, but they... We haven't covered them yet, and so we're not going to cover each individual as its own series. They're all lumped together in six individual podcasts, beginning with Critters. Yeah, the New Line Cinema answer to Gremlins. It kicked off the summer a little early in April of 1986. That was followed two months later by Invaders from Mars, the remake. Again, we're not doing the originals, we're not doing the sequels, we're doing the movies that came out in summer. This was June 1986, followed by another movie out that same day, Space Camp. The teacher space shuttle film that couldn't have been more badly timed. 
<laughs> Indeed. But it has Kate Capshaw, and uh, we love trashing on her, so it could be some fun there. And then another movie that actually has been heavily requested. We're doing Labyrinth, the David Bowie film that a lot of people have talked about. Jim Henson, right? Yeah, it kind of stopped him making movies for a while, unfortunately. But yeah, Dark Crystal. 